the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop presented by THG ABC as we bring it to you hot and heavy. Welcome and thanks for joining me inside our studio lecture hall, this HBC Sports Lab for the only weekly sports talk radio show that is dedicated to exploring the sporting HBC badge. Diaspora, including the marching sport with its unique HBC cultural identity, the teams, the bands, coaches, athletic directors, commissioners, provosts, presidents, big rivalry matchup, classic game, homecoming events, and much, much more from the HBC Athletic Aesthetics. As we emerge our lecture of sports, business practices, and the competitive sports industry, the show seeks to provide innovative, progressive, and formative dialogue about the week's HBC sporting events, issues, and ideas from a fan's perspective. We review the Southwestern Athletic Conference, better known as WAC, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, better known as the of the NCAA Division I, Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, SIAC, the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, and CIAA of the NCAA Division II, Gulf Coast Athletic Conference, GCAC of the NAIA, and independent programs such as Tennessee State of the OVC, Hampton of the Big South, as well as Eddie Waters as they transition from NAIA to Division II and membership in the SIAC. And man, I guess I got to start saying North Carolina A&T transitioning to the Big South. Florida A&M, mm -hmm. bam, you the big news, transitioning to the SWAC. Man, a lot going on there, Charles. I see you uh, in the background with the last show there. Man, that's a nice little touch, man. You're doing good things coming out of the Masters of Science of Sports Studies, Sports Leadership master's program over there at Texas Southern University. What you say? Correct. Uh, if nothing, uh, I've learned uh, uh, what you guys taught me at Texas Southern University, how to brand. And uh, we're branding in the background back there. <laughs> <laughs> That's big time. Mike, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I still got my Prairie View stuff up in the back. Uh, but uh, you. you branding your Prairie View, branding your album. Uh, so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm I'm so Brandon. Since y'all talking about all this uh, Brandon, I'm going to see if I can do a little something for you and do you like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Say, uh, what about that? <laughs> well, you know, when you're the dean of uh, HBC yeah, sports, exactly. uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess you can do that. <laughs> right, y'all. I'm glad y'all recognize now that y'all finally get an understanding that that's the way it's going to be, the way it's going to happen, the way it is. So with that, uh, let's start with uh, you, Mike, this week. What are some of the HBCU news that's out there? Well, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, you know, unless you've been on another planet, there's two things you probably heard about in the last week or so, and that's, you know, George Floyd, and, and the fan you move, but I'll save that for later. Uh, in lesser news, the MEAC this past Friday wrapped up its 2020 spring meeting and locked down championship formats. And uh, this was a meeting between the presidents and the chancellors, athletic directors, uh, senior women administrators, uh, faculty and representatives. And, you know, I give you know, kudos to Omadon and uh, as well as HBCU game day for breaking this, it was also all over, all over the Twitter. But the biggest change is there was an effort to make travel less expensive for member institutions uh, and the conference office. Many of the championships were shifted uh, to a more centralized format for the 2020-21 year. So, for instance, baseball, softball, tennis, volleyball, will each see championship fields decrease to four teams, and each championship. Uh, will be shortened by a day. Uh, the men's golf championship will be just uh, a three-day event uh, to two days, go from a three-day event to two days, and with 36 holes being played on the first day, I'm sure my uh, compadre and fellow golf player CB can relate to that. Uh, the in indoor and outdoor track and field will each have respective schedules condensed from three days to two, and the same uh, also is the basketball tournament format has also been changed. The first round will take place uh, on the camp respective campus sites with the games being hosted by the higher seeds. So a totally different structure in an effort to save mo money, uh, funding and money. And all of that comes on the heels of COVID-19 and the latest announcement of a school leaving the MEAC. So. Yeah, that's a big time news. We're going to take the second half of the show to really give you some backgrounds and thoughts in terms of 
But we're down. We're going to really need depth. We're also going to a chance to talk about what's next. Uh, but uh, we'll save that for a little bit, uh, if you will. But uh, as we do that, Charles, uh, what are your thoughts right now? And yeah, I, I want to hear you. Give me your thoughts. Let's save that too. Let's look to you that I want to do that. Give me some other news uh, that uh, as, uh, people may be overlooking because of what took place this last week. Sure. And, and I want to start uh, on a somber note, uh, on a somber day here in Houston. Uh, but I wanted to mention the passing of the great uh, Ken Riley. This comes from uh, our friends at uh, HBC Sports, uh, Ken Rashad, the football world, and Florida A&M University, a uh, loss of legend, Ken Riley, former head coach and athletics director, who passed away early Sunday morning at the age of 72. So I definitely want to uh, sin, uh, uh, big time loss. Yes, big time loss in terms of uh, losing King Riley, uh, who was a, a scholar, uh, a, a guy who uh, had should be on the short list in terms of getting to the NFL Hall of Fame. Sixty-five uh, interceptions uh, during his career in the NFL. Uh, all around scholar in terms of reading up on him. I did not know he was a running for the world scholar. City class president, in high school city class wow. president, in yeah. college as well, and an alpha man as well. So definitely, um, definitely yeah. want to send our deepest condolences to Fort A and M University fan. Then you did yeah. learn. Yeah. I'm glad you put that out now. there in regards to uh, the alpha man. Mike, you had some thoughts on that you wanted to share him as well. No, I, I was just going to say, I didn't realize until I started reading that he was a man of uh, Alpha Phi Alpha as well. Um, so just to code, I did not know that. Um, I totally agree with CB, you know, totally, totally, totally on the short list, if not <laughs> the next pick uh, for the Hall of Fame, being, you know, top five in interceptions. But um, I, that, that Alpha Phi Alpha is one that, that escaped me until I started reading. Yeah, I, I didn't realize in terms of his academic problems, that would be news that Charles put out there. I realized you know, about the, uh, uh, the 06, 1906 as our producer back there, you, you know, we want to make sure that we push that a little bit when his news back and forth. I know that he, he loves to hear that type of talk. We yeah, have to make sure that um, from our thing, we're being listening to peace and all seriousness to his family. He is a rally, so we're going to make sure that we certainly give appropriate kudos there. Uh, they were um, doing a big push. Um, a lot of folks are pushing, in my opinion, appropriately in terms of pushing for the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, they had escaped him. It's unfortunate that we couldn't get it done before he has transitioned. But it doesn't still mean that uh, appropriately that it should be done because he has all the indications in terms of the point. Uh, uh, I mean, statistics that suggest that he should be in there. Um, so hopefully they, they, that comes around uh, for all its fans and friends and more importantly his family can celebrate that. So hopefully that takes place in a lot of ways. Before I go back to you, Mike, uh, with some additional news you may have, I just want to give a shout out for the folks that have joined us. Jimmy is always very neutral uh, uh, as he's doing the work in the background taking care of us. Demetrius, previous student of mine, he was in the grad school at LSU. Um, looking at education administration, still keep up with him as uh, he's getting things done. Shout out to him, Michael E.C. I'm eating boudin, so he's excited. Take care of yourself, boudin. You must be nice. You must be excited about the good news over there, Mike. We throwing in your boy, Chuck Hunt, checking in as always from Monroe, Louisiana. Yes, yes, Michael E.C. It must be good, do they say something for that? Nice hype there, don't be doing that to him. Jake Mack, Atlanta in the house. Jake Mack, I'm, uh, my book is coming in. I can't wait to get that, man. I got both of the magazines he does with this pictorial display. I can't wait to get that. Um, and as soon as we get it out of the we're going to get a chance to get him on so we can talk about it a little bit, talk about his life as a uh, photographer. It's you know, amazing. We're going to get a chance Energy folks, and usually they talk with the camera, so we're gonna get to see how he does getting by from behind the camera in front of it and talking about it. Chuck Hunt says, What's up, Ken, Charles, and Mike? Yes, yes, yes. Meet you, Chuck. What's up, Doc? Lonnie yes. Shaw, North Carolina, AT, Aggie Pride is in the house. <laughs> losing too much weight, Doc. Going to fade away on us. No, no, I am trying to lose it. I can give y'all an update. Your boy is at 51 pounds down. Can you believe it? I can't have some 
Yeah, I don't want to disappear on you, but I still want to get this weight out. So I appreciate y'all supporting, pushing me, mm-hmm. celebrating me. Uh, for me, it, it means a lot. You know, I couldn't do it without y'all on the serious motivation work for me really well. So uh, besides my family, all the support I'm getting in, uh, I appreciate y'all going in and just getting it done for me. Our man, Tailgate, Prayer View Booster, Extraordinary Alumni, G. Boom Holly, getting to catch well, y'all live. They, they the rain them. Appreciate you, Holly. Getting to them rain them. Uh, taking care of us out there. Uh, first responders in so many ways. Much love to you. Appreciate you. Anthony Wesley, Alabama A&M, them Bulldogs. Boy, that fam, you Bulldog match up with them A&Ms. It's going to be something <laughs> interesting. Just like oh, the SIAC Rivals. And you going yeah. back to those championship days in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Boy, there used to be some knockout matchups taking those trains. Uh, down to play Florida A and M in the Orange Blossom Classic, getting Prairie View in Texas for the Prairie View Bowl, the first bowl for you all that know a little bit about your history. You know what's up. So just giving y'all some shout out, man. These folks giving us some love out here today. Uh, so um, talking about a little bit of hum in the audio. We'll see what we can get on that. I think that might be the fan blowing behind you a little bit. Uh, as it's gotten a little hot out here, you know, temperature, it's summertime, so we'll see if we can reconstruct that. Chuck Hunt says, Cincinnati Bill, great Ken Riley, rest in peace. Michael Jones is checking so out. He said, don't forget about the brave or the... He said, he's going to really respect you with that smoke. Y'all talking all about the rallies. He said, they going to do what they do to everybody else. Just take them back out. I mean, that's ugly. And he just says, y'all mics are hot, balance the audio live, mix Distortion. All right, we'll check it out. Coming in there a little bit. I thought it was just me. Stunt Hummy is there, so we're working on a little audio on the background. We're there a little bit. Coming in there, so as we produce, I want to shout out to Barry. Jimmy is uh, talking about this. Say, I'm looking good. Appreciate it. Yeah, I told you I was trying to get it done. He says it's going to be a wild ride. So that's a shout out for some people out there. J Max says, Bethune Cookman will follow Fam You. I'm not too sure about uh, that. We'll go a deeper dive in that. I think there's some points in the fact that that conversation should come up. But I think there's some concerns uh, that may be out there in, th- in terms of Bethune Cookman, not from the Bethune Cookman side. I think they'll look at it. And, and I think there will be some inner discussion on whether they want to stay in the MEAC. Uh, I'll give you some reason why the MEAC is still viable and from a financial position as we get into that a little more. Uh, but you, there's some things in that you might want to consider. That I don't think people are thinking about in the sweat that have to come up there. But with that, let's go back to Mike. Any other news that you want to share? Well, sure. Uh, North Carolina ATs, uh, Cameron Langley will get a chance to uh, add to his already record setting numbers in the midst of COVID 19 season. He's made the chance, decision to return to Greensboro and withdraw his name from the NBA draft. Now, I got this, again, courtesy to HBC Game Day, uh, Instagram sites, uh, a couple of other sites, uh, the North Carolina a t site as well uh, on, on social media. So Langley led the NCAA in assists during the 2019-20 season, <coughs> averaging eight assists per game. He broke the school record and MEAC uh, records for assists with his total sitting at 600 north of 630. Uh, after three seasons. So the native, Greensboro native, with uh, recorded two triple doubles as a junior, averaging nine and a half points, 5.2 rebounds, two steals a game. Uh, so his play helped North Carolina finish uh, second in the MEAC regular season race uh, when it's uh, MEAC tournament opener before the tournament was called off due to COVID 19. Just one story of a decision that our young men will have to make, especially those ones who were kind of on the bubble in terms of either going to that next level, whether it be football or basketball, <clears throat> or and then or deciding to return for their you know final year. So I'm sure we'll see more decisions like that. But, uh, this North Carolina A&T uh, player certainly has made uh, put a lot of thought into that decision, and uh, we wish him the best. So that courtesy of a lot of news sources. So I know we're talking about uh, football, but thought it important in the midst of COVID-19 to kind of get that in there, that we still have players making those key decisions because of COVID-19. Great point um, as you bring that uh, going in there. Charles, what news do you have 
coming in for us. Yeah, this, this is pretty huge. And a couple of uh, high-profile transfers uh, in the SWAC. Uh, the first, uh, we look at women's basketball. Uh, former uh, SWAC player of the year, Joyce Kerrison. Uh, she has announced that she will be transferring from Texas Southern to University of Arkansas Pine Bluff for her last year of eligibility. So if you remember Joyce Kennerson, uh, back during her time at Texas Southern, she led the Lady Tigers in scoring, uh, and briefly led the nation in scoring, scored over 1,000 points during her career at Texas Southern. Uh, she will be joining Don Brown uh, with the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff Golden Lions. Also, transferring from Alabama State for his last year uh, is Jacoby Ross. He's one of Alabama State's uh, leading scorers and he will be transferring to Alcorn. So, uh, two big uh, high-profile transfers within the league. Man, that's uh, interesting. Good point. Yeah, when I when I saw that, that did that, that, that kind of stunned me. I was like, that was, I was like, ooh, where did that come from? Uh, that's a uh, big time there when, when you look at what's going on there. Uh, Mike, any additional news? Any uh, Anything else that you want to share there? No, I think we're ready to talk to some of the big enchiladas that are on the plate. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I know there's a lot of news about, you know, the SWAC, you know, their movements, a lot of, you know, MEAC talk. So, I'll, I'll, I'll hold hold off my news till we get into those discussions. So, well, well so, I, I, I got to move. All right, go so, ahead. Uh, Doc, I got to get my, 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 my joystick ready because the SWAC is rolling out eSports for uh, eSports Championship. So, I wanted to make yep. a mention of that. That esports championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those sneak that out there. Yeah. None of y'all put that out there. Y'all, y'all just let that uh, big news uh, get off there. Uh, but uh, Charles Graff didn't got out of there and made sure that was on the table. Sponsored by the United States Air Force. Uh, mm -hmm. That was big to get that sponsors and get that support. And, and so uh, it looks like the schools will get into esports uh, in some capacity. So it's going to be interesting to see how that looks moving forward. I might find a way to see if I can get my hands on on that. In that, uh, one thing that I can report at Texas Southern University, we already have two courses that are developed that are on the books. So we'll start looking to offer those, and so that's going to be in a, a line where students can actually start not only be on the uh, playing side that they can participate on the business side of these sports mm -hmm. and, and production and producing it and all those kind of things. So I'm excited about. Uh, the conference being able to get that done in a lot of ways. That should be big. Uh, we'll see what we can do uh, to get uh, some of those key players involved on that, both from the eSports side as well as uh, Charles and Cousin to talk about that from the SWAC perspective. I think that's uh, big news, obviously, uh, with the family news out there. That kind of slides under the radar a little bit, but uh, that's uh, big time in so many different ways. Yeah. As we, as we kind of wait and, and see what's going on, let's jump into it a little bit. Since in a lot of ways, that's what everybody wants to hear, different perspectives uh, in regards to Florida A&M University announcing last week uh, from the Board of Regents, uh, as they call on that side, Board of Trustees, their intentions to uh, exit the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, uh, which they had to do before July 1st to only pay the re requisite 250 k uh, and join the SWAC essentially a year later, which means they would start in the 21-22 season, much like what we heard earlier with North Carolina a &T. So two teams are exiting the uh, MEAC at the same time essentially after this year, uh, with one going to the Big South and the other going to uh, Southwestern Athletic Conference. So it'll be interesting to see what that means in terms of going forward. That same day, um, the athletic directors from the South Af Southwestern Athletic Conference voted. It was unanimous, just like the Board of Trustees. And then you have the fact that the presidents met uh, soon after that on a call uh, where they made their vote. Uh, and it was unanimous uh, to bring Florida in. So that's interesting there. So before we get into some more discussion in terms of what's nexus, if you will, I uh, just wanted to get your opinions on what your thoughts are on that. Obviously, we did a show that day, a combined show uh, with Brian and AD uh, with us, and that was fascinating. Uh, it resonated with the people. We've had over 5,000 uh, uh, views on it uh, in terms of one uh, recording that I saw uh, sites on it, so I was excited about that. Uh, so I wanted to get your thoughts in terms of what's going on there. So with that, Charles, tell me, what are your thoughts on that taking place? Well, obviously, by the, the unanimous 
uh, vote to bring Florida a and into the conference. Obviously, the presidents are excited. Uh, by any measure, uh, whomever that you may talk to, uh, Florida a and is, is one of the preeminent brands in, in HBCU athletics, uh, not just in terms of HBCU, HBCU athletics, but also on the academic side as well. So uh, you're, you're talking about a school that not only brings all this uh, tradition uh, from the HBC athletics side, but uh, they bring another law school into the conference. So I, I'm, you know, I wasn't surprised at all by uh, the fact that the, the presidents voted unanimously to bring this team in, and then the excitement that they bring in uh, with uh, the potential matchups. The, everybody, I think, talked about uh, their story rivalry with Southern, uh, the, the battles that they've had with Jackson State, but you get an opportunity to bring not just uh, the athletics part into it, but uh, you bring uh, another uh, highly <laughs> visible band into the conference as well. So they're, they're just their brand exposure coming into the swag is going to be huge. Mike, what are your thoughts on uh, now that a couple of days have set in? What, what are your thoughts now you had a little more time to think about it? Obviously, uh, I don't think much has changed, but what are your mm-hmm. thoughts? I, I think uh, it's, it's tremendous in that uh, we said it from the outset, you create, in essence, kind of a, a African-American SEC conference or in terms of power, uh, in terms of prestige, in terms of branding. Um, we said that with FAMU come, uh, transferring to the SWAC, you increase the overall branding of the SWAC by the order of magnitude. I don't know if you can quantitatively measure that, but you change the notion by how the, the SWAC is branded. The SWAC already had a very good brand. Now adding FAMU to it increases that exponentially by an order of magnitude. Um, I think you also look at the other aspects. You look at not only the football matchups, but you look at the band matchups. You look at the the intriguing matchups. You look at also, uh, on the other side, what it means for other conferences, because for every move there's a ripple effect. What does this now mean for the SEAC? What does this now mean for SIEC? What does this now mean for the CIAA? It's going to have some reverberating effects, and we'll see in the next coming weeks and months what that really means as conferences get. What's the SWAC's next step? Um, um, but uh, there is, without question, no doubt about it. Um, of course, everyone talks about the Southern versus FAM or the, the FAM versus Jackson State, but what's all equally intriguing is maybe a FAM versus a Prairie View or a TSU because – FAM has a large uh, alumni base in Texas, so um, you, you, it creates dynamics in the, uh, the recruiting wars because they're going to recruit heavily in Texas because of the presence. So it opens Florida, Florida too. <laughs> it opens, yeah, exactly. It opens Florida too. So there's any number of ways this thing can go, and it's, it's so much excitement for, for the SWAC and HBCU football. I, I want to dig in a little more in terms of that recruiting component. Um, and I'm going to shift it over to Charles and get you to follow back up with that. And I thought that was intriguing how you talked about that. You know, obviously a lot of people are celebrating the idea of uh, Southern and FAMU, uh, Jackson State and FAMU. Rightfully so, a lot of history between those matchups. And what's even more ingrained in a lot of people, the fact the most recent SWAC type of matchups are being right there. Then you have, uh, obviously, the fascinating matchup with Grambling, uh, with Alcorn State being the champions of the conference the last couple of years. That's going to stick out, too. But then you have that matchup uh, right down the road, and I think some people have kind of dirty in that with Alabama State. Uh, I mean, they become really border, uh, easy travel for both institutions. you got a big-time alum from both institutions at Atlanta. It's not a big drive. To get to either place, Montgomery or Tallahassee from Atlanta, so you think you bring a lot of fans over uh, from that component. Obviously, your natural fans that always come in, uh, even more so now coming out of uh, Florida in terms of Orlando and Tampa. Uh, so that's going to be a fascinating matchup. But then, like you said, you have a little bit about that A&M fight between Alabama and A&M. Fam, you to go back to the SIC. I think they were in different divisional alignments, so you had more matchups between Alabama State and probably Fannie and Alabama A&M, but uh, the fact that they were housed in there and played together uh, would be interesting. But then you talk about the Texas School. You won't forget Arkansas Pondra, Valley as well. But let's shift shape a little bit over there in terms of 
Everybody always likes the idea. I'll take a pinch of this, Charles. Likes the idea when they talk about this Florida and Texas matchup. You know, yeah. you know, speed versus speed. All the supposed talent in Texas. Mm -hmm. All the talent in Florida. We know there's a lot of talent coming out of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Don't take this. Mm -hmm. But this is just these big states. Tax-free states. So a lot of people go to these places. You know, these big schools. You got all these nice schools. 5A, 6A schools in Texas. But you say they like to eat. They like to eat down there in Fairview. They like to eat. talk about the rabbit fields and different places. And yeah, so I'm interested when you talk about this class. You know, whether it's coming into Houston as you talk about recruiting photo ground, folks want to find a way to get into Miami, Tampa, Orlando. They would sneak in there every once in a while, but now that just seems in a lot of ways wide open. Because now you come out of Florida, come, you'd be like, yeah, you're going to get to play. Come home, you know, play in, you know, fam, you probably twice in your career if you start as a freshman. Mm -hmm. Certainly at least once. Uh, the same with Prairie View. You come down there, another A&M versus A&M type matchup. Fascinating and how that goes. So, Charles, what do you think about this Florida-Texas thing? It's exciting. It really is. I mean, when you talk about... Uh, Texas, you talk about Houston being one of those HBCU epicenters where everybody comes here and, 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 and gets their feel of what they need out of the Houston area. Same uh, with Dallas uh, and, and San Antonio as well. A lot of tremendous football is, is played uh, in all three of those uh, cities and in between. Uh, then you take a look at you know what I think is will be very interesting. You've seen lately within probably the last uh, five to seven years uh, a lot of uh, HBCUs are hitting that Tampa area. Uh, Mike Jones knows this very well. Alcorn dip their toes uh, extensively into Florida because they were finding recruits who wanted to come. So I think it's huge that you kind of have this Florida-Texas dynamic now and, and uh, you know, the family coming in that opens up Florida a little bit more. Uh, we, we talk about the Tampa area, we talk about the West Coast of Florida, but who knows? You, they're going to have to kind of build a little bit of a, 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 a cover around South Florida because I think a lot of HBCUs are going to get down into that Miami area. So it's going to be really fun watching Florida and Texas kind of battle it out for recruiting supremacy. So with that, Mike, you know, you kind of started this off. Um, and so what are your thoughts on this Texas-Florida um, matchup that you – kind of sprinkled out there before you took that deep dive. Now I'm going to give you a chance to take a deep dive. And then I want you to start talking about what's next in terms of these SWAC. Where, where are they going and why do you feel that way? And I'll tie it in to give you some more perspective depending on your take. But first, give me a little bit about how you feel about this Texas Florida. You know, you get excited when you hear these high school, big time high school championship programs from Texas and you match up, obviously, uh, every once in a while, you get the big time programs, college wise, match up, Texas, Florida, and a lot of people be excited. But now we have it at the HBCU level. And not only is it just a matchup, it's a conference matchup. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, <clears throat> first on the higher level, with, with this matchup, uh, I think you have more potential to bring uh, or attract more of the casual fans to an HBCU event. Uh, yes, you're going to have the hardcore HBCU folks who say, this is a classic Texas-Florida matchup. <clears throat> you got fan you coming to Texas. You got the Marching 100. You've got large alumni base, and then Texas goes around to Florida. But the matchup in itself, at least if you consider San Antonio, Dallas, the uh, Houston area, or the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Austin area, now you start mm -hmm. to bring more casual fans, in my opinion, to HBC, or you have more of a potential to. In terms of the talent in and of itself, that pendulum swings both ways, because yeah. while, while VP Gaucher said, yeah, we got alumni there, we want to do a lot of, uh, and Colonel Green, uh, who's head of the uh, FAMU National Alumni, said, yeah, we got alumni, we can market fan, we can get some of that tech. The Texas school's too short, because when they make that I-10 trip to Florida, they'll have access, just like CB was saying, to to that Tampa area, to that Tallahassee area, 
and when they see what the Texas schools have to offer, you consider a, an interesting intermingling of talent. Um, and then you have bragging rights. How much bragging rights is this going to be? Texas athletes against Florida athletes, speed against speed. Who has it? They had this at the high school version, believe it or not. Uh, there was a high school playoff game, or I'm sorry, high school all-star game. Texas All-Stars against Florida All-Star. They had it going for two or three years. So it's nice to have that at the HBCU level. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how the pendulum swings in terms of overall talent battle, who matches up better, and who can attract. I guess you're going to attract, with this matchup, you're going to attract a lot more what I call transfer, transfer portal candidates. Mm. With this type of matchup, I believe. Wow, uh, he had to sneak in the transfer portal component. Now, that's a little jewel. That's what Mike does. <laughs> Look at Mike. Let's get into people who are storming the bits and they're asking, you know, what are our opinions on what's next? And so let's take some time and kind of break this down. Um, let's start uh, with the big fish out there and a lot of people's opinions which is Tennessee State. You know, there's some people that say they're public, big brand, obviously a lot of people put it out there. Um, I want to first take a bite where we look at it in terms of the OVC and what does it even look like if you put them in a division and travel. And the question is, is obviously it looks like they're obviously going to the East with FAMU, which means somebody from the East has to ship over um, to the West. And so, um, as we get John, he looks like he's setting up, so we'll bring him on shortly um, uh, as he's doing that and get a little more into the conversation. And we'll continue this back again as a nice little tease for everybody to talk about that um, in terms of uh, what's going on there uh, as he sets up. But let me tease it out uh, as we're getting it set up, and then we'll be able to maybe review it a little bit and come back and see what's going on. Uh, but uh, at this point, if you had... Uh, Tennessee State in terms of the OBC. We we'll look at it in terms of Bethune Cookman in terms of the uh, coming into the SWAC. What does that look like? Um, and then I'll throw in some other things. But I think we got John about set up. Uh, we're asking him to unmute his mic and then we'll bring him right in uh, to uh, bring him on and get him going. As we're excited to have the executive director, John Grant of the MEAC SWAC Challenge and Celebration Bowl, join us. Uh, John, it's good to see that you are listening appropriate uh, to everybody that's saying stay at home. And the reason I say that, I can tell that you haven't had the chance to really go to the bar. <laughs> so that's the, the tough thing of not just having your voice, that we get your handsome face on the line, and we get to see that you are following those social distancing uh, uh, recommendations. And so that's good because the people need to see that big time people like yourself are following guidelines. And maybe they'll be saying so we can have some football this year. We do follow the guidelines. We have our masks uh, ah. as well as um, staying, at ho staying at home. But we're following protocol. I've got a mask there. I've got yes. my thermometer gun here. <laughs> I've got uh, <laughs> I've got my hand sanitizer, so we're keeping our hands clean. We're checking our temperature. We're wearing our mask, and in the event that we do feel bad and we haven't, so thank goodness for that. You know, we're prepared to, to shelter in place. <clears throat> oh man, this, this is see, you heard it first. <laughs> <laughs> Representative of the ESPN, the heck, Swag Challenge Celebration Bowl Executive Director John Grant giving good words of wisdom in terms of what's going on there. With that, uh, let me ask you, looking good, so how have you been doing uh, as well as your family and your support staff? Well, thank you so much for um, first having me on. I'm delighted to see you as well. I mean, it's been a minute, although we've talked by phone um, yeah, but, uh, recently, but um, everyone here is doing well, and uh, we're, we're making sure that we're, we've been following the guidelines, we've been social distancing, like as you see, I've we um, got plenty of hand sanitizer. We're keeping our hands clean. Um, we wear a mask. We're out in public. We did that today. I went to vote. And we have voting here in Georgia today and waited in line for <coughs> two three hours. But we we, um, we fulfilled our civic duty and cast our vote today. And I encourage people, no matter what state you're in, when, it, when it's time to vote in your state, please, please make sure you get out 
um, and exercise your right and vote. And that's what uh, um, these marches and, and the protests are, are obviously about police brutality, but it's also all of that can be solved uh, when we exercise our right also to vote and vote for the right people in office, not only in the national election, elections, but it's more important to vote in your local elections, your city council people, your mayors, your district attorneys, um, all of these people who are at your judges. Uh, it's important that we get out and exercise that right. Thank you for that now, civic message uh, on the civic question. issue. That, that was timely and appropriate, and I'm glad that you uh, shared that with us, uh, that you believe in that and pushing that and, and, and showing action in regards to how you want to move us forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Hunt wanted to jump out there and say, Mr. John Grant, enjoying seeing him doing a celebration boat, they put together a great event. Uh, and so with that said, let's jump right into it, give you a chance to uh, really talk about this year's event. But before we do that, you heard all the talk out there. Everybody uh, is scared to death, which is appropriate, which is a good thing. That means they enjoy what you <coughs> all, as you just said, what you put together a celebration boat. But with some of the things that happened, reaching back a little bit with North Carolina A&T, obviously most recently with them, <coughs> what can you tell us about the NEAC SWAC Challenge and the celebration moving forward? Well, let me be the final word for all the people out there who are listening. The NEAC SWAC Challenge and Celebration Bowl are going to be just fine. We are in um, communications with both conferences now to extend the agreement. This year, this year represents the last current contractual uh, year of the current agreement, but we will be extending it. And the Celebration Bowl and MEAC SWAC Challenge are vital uh, components in the HBCU space. They're vital to ESPN and to the Walt Disney Company. And we will, without question, uh, be extending those events um, into future years. So. Those who are asking the question, I hope they're asking the question because they're trying to decide whether they're going to do the tickets or not. <laughs> um, so let me tell you now, you can go ahead and make your hotel reservations for the MIAC SWAG Challenge. You can go ahead and visit MIACSWAGChallenge.com to get your tickets for this year's game and then schedule yourself for Labor Day weekend in 2021 uh, for that game as well. So we will be around. Certainly. You heard it here first. Uh, you asked for it. And I went and got the individual that could tell you. Executive Director Don Grant of the MEX Lake Challenge and Celebration Bowl told you that this is uh, important to him. It's important to ESPN. Uh, it's certainly one of the pillars of HBCU sports in regards to that. And they're working to move forward uh, and close out this contract and extend it so there's in talks. So looking like everything is going to move forward. So I wanted to do that. With that, before I allow Charles to jump in here and ask a question, I wanted to give a shout out to Lonnie Shaw. He's a big time fan of our show, always shows up, and he always lets us know Aggie Pride. So he wanted to say John Grant, Aggie Pride. Aggie Pride. Lane, Lane Lab. <laughs> <laughs> now see, Mr. Shout Grant, you were going, going well. You were going well. Well, to you. Right. Every Saturday from 10 to 12 Central Time, uh, you can uh, go to the Open Mic Network and catch him. Uh, program that I follow, we work together. Uh, a friend of our show, he always supports us, follow us. So, I wanted to shout out him. Continue to check us out and do uh, things of that nature. Uh, uh, Mark Hancock is checking us out. Chris Gardner's doing uh, checking us out. Chris Gardner is a part of the team for you all that don't know. He does a lot of stuff for us uh, from a uh, management side in terms of what we need to get done behind the scenes off the show. So I want to shout him and say thank you to him personally. With that, don't want to hold up any further, John, but I uh, wanted to make sure I got that in for Lonnie Shaw so he make sure he got back to the show and support her. Uh, with that, Charles, Bishop, you have a follow-up question you want to ask? Yeah, I, I do, and this actually, my phone is blowing up here. I'm, I'm going to take the one here from my aunt. Uh, she lives uh, in the Maryland area. Yeah, you better take that with you. <laughs> 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 yeah, you better take that with you. She's in the Maryland area. She's, she's a MEAC uh, follower of Morgan State and Howard, and she wanted to know, uh, uh, Mr. Grant, what was your reaction to Florida A&M uh, moving to the sweat? Well, I, I 
don't think I can add any more than has already been added by Commissioner McClellan and uh, and uh, as it relates to them welcoming uh, Florida in, in, into the SWAT. Um, we all followed this, the news stories. I did just like everyone else. Um, I did sit in on their board of trustees meeting and committee meeting and just, uh, you know, by, by a phone and listened in um, to those discussions. You know, the great thing about historically black colleges and universities and about our two fantastic conferences, the Mid-East and Athletic Conference and the Southwestern Athletic Conference, you know, conference realignments happen, and they happen not just in HBCUs, but they've been happening across the country. And they, they will continue to happen. That's just the nature and evolution of, uh, of, of this business. The Mid-East and Athletic Conference is a strong conference. Um, they've got a great administrator there with Dr. Dennis Thomas. But there's a lot of rich history into that conference. And certainly uh, um, looking at the, the, the information that Florida a and put forth, um, they, they made an, an, a decision and a move that was in the interest of, of Florida a and uh, University based on today's um, circumstances. Uh, certainly it, it bodes well for the SWAC. Um, it means that they, you know, being the oldest FCS conference in the country uh, and celebrating their 100 year anniversary um, to add Florida a and is a big is a big win for them but you still have some great and um, powerhouse um, universities in the Mid-East and Athletic Conference that will still make this a very competitive um, um, environment as it relates to the MEAC SWAC Challenge and Celebration Bowl um, you know, in the years to come. So I have great confidence in in um, in, in Commissioner Thomas um, and certainly a great deal of confidence and respect for um, Commissioner McClellan as they move forward and, 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 and there are two great administrators in, uh, in, out there in FCS football and in the NCAA. So I think we're going to be just fine um, going forward and, you know, Nothing happens, change doesn't happen without disruption. And what we're seeing right now is we're in a period of, of disruption, uh, not just uh, uh, in this move, or with the move with North Carolina a and and with Hampton University, but it gives a great opportunity uh, for the Mid-East and Athletic Conference to do what they've done and what Dr. Thomas continues to be there, and uh, he'll provide some great leadership for that conference going forward. I know he will. Sure thing. Certainly. With that, I'm going to jump straight to you, Mike. Do you have a follow-up question you want to ask? Uh, yes, Doc. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Uh, Mr. Grant, you mentioned that you were in the final, I guess, year of the existing contract and you're looking to extend it. What, if any, different changes, nuances can we see in the extension? And is there any part of the latest departure of tag team from the MEAC that may impact the nuances of that new extension by chance. What can you we might, expect in them? That is a great <laughs> question. My time to get the negotiation to, <laughs> it, is a, it is a tremendous question, but let me give you this answer that you're hearing here first uh, on this show. No comment. <laughs> Yeah, that's the first time I've ever what? heard John say no comment. Well, well, we're not going to go that one. We're going to that one. Save that one for the archive. No, <laughs> wow. Uh, God, with that said, let me ask a follow up question before I push it back to Charles and then uh, Mike for a follow up as well. Talk about um, some of the things that you're working on. Obviously, we're in the middle of a COVID 19 pandemic. As everybody, we joke a little bit about, uh, but all seriousness, you're doing what's never uh, necessary to protect yourself. And so when we talk to the ADs, uh, Commissioner Charles, uh, from perspective, getting that uh, off the record, talking to presidents in regards to that, you've heard them talking about these different type of plans that they, they had to look at and based on how things are changing so rapidly. So now uh, let's hear from your perspective. What does that mean as an executive director of a challenge classic um, bowl game? Are you having to do several different plans on how you move forward? Are you just charging forward? How does that look from your perspective 
of planning a, a classic challenge, as he's talking about, the New Expect Challenge first, and then long range, obviously, the bowl game coming into this uh, 2020 season? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, our responsibility is to make sure that, that we are providing the safest possible environment for the student athletes, coaches, their staff, for our fans, and certainly, um, you know, for for all of the employees and, and staff and volunteers that will be working the event. So we have been laser focused on doing that. We have the benefit being um, a a property, meaning the MEAC SWAC Challenge kickoff, being owned by um, the Walt Disney Company. We have the benefit of some of the best minds um, in 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 that space because. The protocols that Disney utilized to reopen their the park in Shanghai, the protocols that the Walt Disney Company, along with you know all the appropriate health officials and 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 working with the state and local governments, etc., to reopen on Ju- July the 18th, will be reopening Disney in Orlando. So there is a there are standards and protocols that have been utilized to open those massive. Um, theme parks. We have had the benefit of studying those, taking those those um, those strategies, and implementing them into what we're doing uh, at the MEAC SWAC Challenge kickoff, and what we'll also be doing um, with the Celebration Bowl. But the first things first, we want to make sure that we're prepared. That when football kicks off on Labor Day weekend, as you notice, I didn't say if. When football <laughs> kicks off on Labor Day weekend, <laughs> that we have we have provided the best and safest environment, utilizing um, strategies that have been developed um, uh, by by experts uh, to welcome you know our fans to make sure that they can have a great uh, and safe environment. To certainly the teams uh, to make sure that it's, it's safe for them, uh, the bands and cheer as well as uh, all of the staff. So that's what we've been diligently focused on, and we feel like we have a very comprehensive plan that's, that's, that's being vetted right now by, um, by our safety and security uh, personnel within the Walt Disney Company. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's important. It's something that our followers and listeners certainly wanted to get a better understanding of what does that look like. And it'll tie back to what a lot of our institutions are doing. For the sake of time, we'll be able to bring you back and, and, and get you going uh, so we can talk a little bit more. But before I do that, I want to make sure we give you a chance to tell folks again how they can get their tickets, how they can book their reservations uh, for the MEAC SWAC Challenge, and then start looking forward to the Celebration Bowl, uh, which will be an interesting chapter as a lot of things are changing. Uh, I'm sure that people don't want to miss that because this is going to be in some ways the final chapter of one component of what is taking place with these institutions, particularly from the MEAC that are fighting to get to the Celebration Bowl, and in a lot of ways, even for the SWAT in terms of how things are changing for the 2021 season. So if you would tell everybody how they can get their tickets, how they can look for more information, how they can continue to follow what's going on in the MEAC and reserve the hotels. Well, um, thank you for saying, you know, this year, uh, because Florida and m nor North Carolina a t will be leaving the MEAC until 2021, uh, in uh, June of 2021. Uh, so, you know, this year is going to be an interesting year, as I'm sure both of those institutions are going to be playing their hearts out to try to win the conference championship uh, in their in their last year at the MEAC to, to, to punch that ticket to the Celebration Bowl. <laughs> but, with, you know, but, you know, the season starts Labor Day weekend. September 6th, uh, we'll be here in Atlanta. Uh, we've got Grammy State University representing the SWAT. We'll be taking on uh, South Carolina State Bulldogs representing the MEAC. Uh, we have a 2.30 kick time, and the game will be televised live on ESPN2. So we'll be, be before a national audience there. Um, you can visit the MEAC SWAT Challenge.com, MEAC SWAT Challenge.com for tickets and information. But I wanna, do want to talk about one thing before we go off. Because uh, this year's game uh, and our uh, uh, an initiative that we launched on May the 26th 
called Hometown Heroes. Mm. We are utilizing this year's game from the MIAC SWAC Challenge kickoff as well as the Celebration Bowl to get, to highlight and give recognition to those frontline people that were um, out there keeping our economy going during the COVID pandemic shutdown. So your grocery store clerks, your delivery drivers, your 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 sanitation workers, your postal workers, um, and so forth and so on. These are the the people that that were you know had to go to work, were out there doing their job. Many of them went out in the early parts of it without PPE, um, but yet they were there to make sure that you know the food food supply chain um, continued to flow. Um, that we were that the essential services that were necessary uh, to keep us going were there. So you can visit, again, MiaxWackChallenge.com or the CelebrationBowl.com and nominate someone that you know as a hometown hero. We're building a virtual wall on both of those websites where those individuals' names will go and they can have, have a place to um, be recognized. And we all know people. Um, but we want to make sure that those people, just as importantly as doctors and nurses and people in the medical who were right on the front line dealing with patients, there were other people who were working in warehouses, who were doing the, the, the kind of work that to make sure that we could still go and not, you know, and have food on our table, that it was accessible to us, that were stocking shelves um, and doing those things. They are heroes, too. And so we are utilizing the opportunity to get them recognized. You can go there and nominate as many people as you want. Um, we will be uh, weekly identifying four people that will be our weekly hometown heroes. But everyone that's nominated, their name will go on our virtual wall. And we want to make sure that there are thousands of people um, that are acknowledged and, that they, and, and, and represent and know that they have been appreciated, that they have been appreciated uh, for themselves also, putting themselves out on the line, taking care of their families, but more importantly, making sure that we um, were taken care of as well. So, MiaxWackChallenge.com and CelebrationBowl.com nominate your local hometown hero. Man, that is tremendous, and I'm, I'm yes. glad that you uh, took time to show you in there. And so, nice. applaud you for um, Big time. doing that. I think it's important that we get recognized in those individuals that are literally uh, first uh, out there to do all the battle in regards to making sure that we can have necessities to keep us where we need to be in a lot of ways based on what we're hearing at home. So I appreciate uh, that you all uh, put that together. That's tremendous. Now, okay, I'm John, uh, now I'm expecting to see the names of everybody on this show on that site having nominated someone. Uh, um, and for uh, and please remind all your listeners, this is so important. Yeah. It's going to go on. We launched it May 26th. It will continue all the way through uh, November. Um, let's make sure that we do um, give those people the appropriate due. Nothing more than exciting for someone to be able to tell a family member, hey, visit this website and you'll see my name there um, because someone um, believed that I was important and True. we want them to know that they are important. Challenging. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 challenging. Challenge. we'll bring you back on to, to continue to talk about that, but we'll see what we can do uh, to cut uh, part of this up and we'll send it to you make sure that you approve of it and then we'll run it as a clip uh, throughout the show and as we're marketing and showing stuff like Thank that. You. Make sure that we get Absolutely. stuff out there. So we'll make a commitment to run, continue to bring you back and see what we can do to kind of produce uh, uh, what you just said here so people can continue to hear it and get that information out so we can actually go to the website and do it. With that, I want to say thank you for your time, John. I know it's very valuable. We look thank forward you. to uh, having you back on and you're looking good and appreciate you taking the time out and joining with us. Be safe. And we'll talk with you soon. Thank you so much for yeah. having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. With that, uh, wanted to go over this. We'll get a chance uh, a little bit to dig into it, and then we'll join. We'll send us up just a little bit as we'll jump into uh, Rob Calloway's as he starts to uh, start his show. He'll join us a little bit, so we get a chance to kind of extend that, and we'll get a chance maybe to get his opinion before we get in the show and tell him what he's going to do tonight. 
he has a great interview coming up that you all need uh, would more than likely want to listen to. I think he's going to have Charles uh, on the show tonight. Uh, let me verify that with him. But as I was telling you, one thing that uh, in, interesting, uh, and I know, and I'm not saying in any particular order in terms of my fan, just what's out there in the ether in terms of what's going on. If you look at the OVC, you talk about Tennessee State. Um, currently, as their model is, they play, and we're going to talk about football and extend it to basketball a little bit. But they play uh, Nashville, two Austin players, zero hours is right there, uh, 52 minutes. So essentially an hour away. Tennessee Tech is an hour and 18 minutes away. Nashville is an hour, 55 minutes away, essentially two hours. Uh, Tennessee Martin, two and a half hours. Southeast Missouri, three and a half, three, 23 to be exact. Eastern Kentucky is three and a half hours. Jacksonville is three and a half hours. Eastern Illinois is essentially five hours, 449. In Belmont for basketball, you add in there, and there, that's in Nashville. Uh, so it's right there, zero hours, eight minutes away. Moorhead uh, State is four hours for basketball. And then Southern Illinois is Evansville, four hours and 44 uh, minutes, five hours. And so if you break that down and you compare it to what you're talking about in the SWAC Eastern Division, playing in divisions where you play most of your game, you'll quickly see that it's comparable. Alabama A&M, an uh, hour and a half, uh, 55 minutes, two hours away, essentially. Alabama State, four hours. Jackson State, five hours. Uh, Mississippi Valley State, five hours. FAMU, seven hours in uh, 47 minutes or 50 hours. When you out west, it extends a little bit, but you would not play them on regular rotation. The football, you play like three of them every other year. Basketball, you play three uh, on the road, and three would come to you, and you flip that every other year. So um, you, you talk about that in the uh, Western Division. You have Pine Bluff, five hours. Arcon, Arcon State, excuse me, seven hours. Grambling State, eight hours. Southern, eight hours. Texas Southern, when you get a little further in there, 12 hours per view, essentially 12 hours. Um, so that's something to think about. Well, while a lot of people are saying Tennessee State, and not saying that they're excited about it, you hear fans both sides, some not, some are. Really excited about it, but hadn't hit, really heard anything from the administrative side, and that's where you really have to get this to going. Uh, intriguing about it, you have a new athletic director, um, so uh, Dr. Allen, uh, in regards to what's going on there. So it'll be interesting to see, much like you've seen with Gauthier, Courtney Gauthier, in terms of him looking in terms of making a change, what was necessary in financials and travel. Um, so. It would be interesting when we get into a lot of ways, what does that look like? Um, and additionally to that perspective is the fact that you have uh, beat Bethel Cookman. People are talking about, hey, that's natural. Well, check this out. I did the same thing for Bethel Cookman. And it's a lot more than what you think. Um, Daytona Beach to FAMU, which a lot of people talked about, there was only one uh, school that was within four hours for them, and that's obviously Bethune Cookman, but uh, that's three hours and 51 minutes I got in terms of that four hours. But to Alabama State, next closest one, that's seven hours and 14 minutes. Daytona Beach, Alabama A&M, uh, nine hours and 36 minutes. Mississippi Valley State, that's 11 hours and 58 minutes. This is still in the east now. Uh, to Jackson State, that's 10 hours and 21 minutes. I mean, so that's what you're looking at there. You go to the West, um, it gets huge, to be frank. The closest one is Baton Rouge, Daytona Beach. That's nine hours and 58 minutes. Um, uh, next one would be uh, all Corn State if they ship over to the West. That's 11 hours and 22 minutes. Uh, then you talk about um, Grandland State is 12 hours and 35 minutes. You got uh, Texas Southern will be 13 hours and 45, 49 minutes, which is actually closer than if you took the trip from Arkansas Pine Bluff, which is actually 13 hours and 55 minutes. And then to Prairie View, it's a whopping 14 hours and 30 minutes. That's a drive, obviously. So when you start looking at that in terms of a film cooking, I'm not sure how quick you're going to get those presidents to sign off on it. Fans, nobody will be excited. ADs will right. They might even say they'll try to make it work, but there's a lot of school. You talking about the very reason that fam you said that they wanted to get out of the VA, 
you can add schools in the sweat to get themselves in that same type of situation with their own cooking. Yeah, that's if they want to do it uh, uh, in a lot of ways. So I'm getting a um, little more thought process you want to consider when you talk about that. So, Charles, I see you chopping a bit to jump in there. Uh, and I know when I get these kind of things to you, you'd be like, oh, wow, what? And so that's a perspective I want to hear what you think. Well, I'm, I'm ready to play devil's advocate here, um, uh, especially in regards to, uh, let me, I, I'm, I'll, I'll be Tennessee State fan here. And the fact that y'all keep talking about me coming to the swag, why? I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm in OBC. What, why, why is it fans are, are, are clamoring to bring my brand to this conference? I mean, what, what's up with that? I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, being a Tennessee State fan, like, well, why is it y'all keep calling my name? So. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I was thought you was gonna go in on Bethune but I didn't know you were gonna jump back out of here. <laughs> State, uh, but no, I think that's a valid question. And for me, it's just fans. Fans talk about everything uh, for every reason. And obviously, a lot of this is about what people believe the old brand of Tennessee State is. But what I would tell you is a Tennessee State fan. For me, um, everything that we love about Tennessee State is old. I think. In a lot of ways, Tennessee State, and we get a chance to really dive in it. I think Tennessee State has an identity crisis, and they're going to quickly find themselves irrelevant in a lot of ways if they're not careful in regards to what's going on. Uh, even from a recruiting perspective, yes, it's great to be able to say you have this short distance in terms of everything in Tennessee, but what does that do for recruiting students or recruiting athletes for that matter? Most athletes want to travel outside of the space, especially if they happen to be from Tennessee, Nashville. How can you get so excited about traveling and you're still in the same state for like 90, 80% of your schedule? That's not something that's going to excite you. So you're talking about getting athletes as things change. Which one looks more exciting? Talking about you, we just talked about as a student athlete, you can think about going and getting your roots in Texas if you're from Florida. Or if you're from Texas, you say, man, I want to go check out Florida for a while and see what that looks like. Or going into Louisiana, Mississippi, you can't do that in Nashville. So you have no way that you separated from yourself from your other peers. So I think it's not so much about us. Uh, in my equation, Swag will be fine with or without you. Staying at a level, whatever. Tennessee State is the school that's becoming irrelevant. Um, really, the only time you talk about them is when they play Jackson State and Southern Heritage Classic here and there. The record is nothing that will have you talking about them at the end of the season. And that's in almost any sport other than maybe track and field. And so, uh, if y'all think y'all doing fine, I'm talking to you as you playing the devil has me in Tennessee State, yeah. I'm going to laugh at you and be like, okay, whatever. Uh, they, <laughs> you, you might want to take a different reflection of who you really are and stop mm -hmm. for being superficial in terms of your identity crisis. With that, let me get to Mike and we'll come back to you. After I broke it down with Nashville, uh, Tennessee State, and even more so with Bethune Cookman, when I start telling you about the travel, what are your thoughts on either one of those being viable? Uh, with as from Charles' perspective, Tennessee State doesn't have an interest, and Bethune Cookman to me, in a lot of ways, would be a major concern. Travel even with the divisions. Uh, what are your thoughts? I'll start with the Bethune. Uh, to me, the travel was fairly apparent. And even with the East Division, you're looking at the better portion of a day with travel, finances. Couple that with the fact that you don't know what kind of financial situation the athletic department at Bethune is. If they were even to engage or entertain that idea, could they absorb those costs as a private school? Could they? I can tell you from what I'm seeing, the, the short answer is probably not. So that does not make them a viable uh, candidate. Um, maybe from a branding standpoint, but if you weigh the pros and cons, travel, budgeting, can they get enough students in there to really support the program? Uh, and then we're not just talking about football, we're talking about other sports as well. Can that athletic program sustain that in a SWAC where you have to travel in upwards of seven, eight, nine, ten hours now, maybe 13 plus if you throw in the other side of the SWAC? I think it's a challenge for Bethune. Um, going to Tennessee State, you know, I, I guess I kind of say, it, you know, really it behooves Tennessee State to really strongly consider the SWAC. You know, what really, what revenue are you getting in the OVC? We've talked about 
exposure, but let's talk about revenue. Do they have a game where they can get a half a million dollars in the OBC? No. Do they have any game if they make it to a bowl where they can make 750, a million, a million plus? You have that in the SWAC. Whether they have that in the OBC. What is their relevance in culturally, historically, in the OBC? It's questionable. I don't know. Uh, Talent-wise, they haven't been relevant for some time from a football standpoint, as Dr. Kabil put out. But if you move into the SWAC, now you increase your relevancy to a certain extent. Now you're, you're, you're thrown into the mix of those classics. Now you have the potential, given recruiting, given a program, for a bowl game. So really, the SWAC is fine with or without them. It behooves Tennessee State to really consider it unless – you know, maybe they, they just want to really identify with the OBC, the culture of the OBC, which I don't even know what it is. So um, I, I think, it, you know, the SWAC, is, the SWAC, but you can bring, I, I heard the best comment I heard all day was that Miles College may be a viable, Miles may be a viable candidate. And just from a travel standpoint, culture standpoint, they may be more of a viable candidate, to be honest, than some of the other schools that we're talking about. So, uh, and that was one thought I didn't think of until I started looking at the map. You know, yeah. look at the teams in the East. Easy travel. It's yeah. an easy step up. The only challenge they would have is that uh, going from a D2, D1, there's costs associated with that. Can the swag make it more enticeable for them to step up? But for, you know, Tennessee State, to me, I, to, I don't want to be blunt, but to me, it's it's kind of foolish not to consider the SWAC in this, at this point in time. Considering you have fam, you join it, and their branding value just increased exponentially. And who, go, who knows what's going to come after that? Where are they getting this value monetarily, financially, marketably from the OVC? Yes. Charles, before we jump, let you jump right back in here as you're taking all this butt whooping, uh, we're going to jump in <laughs> and, and bring Rob Calloway, maybe see if he got any thoughts and uh, before this, Rob, we were just talking about breaking down the mileage. And, and for those that don't realize, we had an in-depth conversation. So you can go back to the Rob Calloway HBC report from last Saturday, and you can catch this breakdown where we even do uh, a- analysis on the MEAC and options that they had. Uh, but, so we were touching on that. I've done even some more work since we last talked where I broke down the mileage and just started talking about the mileage with them cooking in regards to how the mileage is uh, huge. We talked about the fact that Tennessee State, while there's some question on whether they want to come, Big Brown, uh, exciting, about how they may be coming irrelevant. And what's interesting is going to be, we're going to get a chance to follow this from Hampton's perspective, as well as North Carolina a t You go into these conferences with the idea that you're going to save some travel. Uh, but if you're not careful, you can get almost too regionally where you don't get a chance to uh, expand your brand outside of your recruiting base. So, let, for example, Nashville students, and you know this living in Atlanta, a lot of Tennessee State students used to come from when the uh, Magic, uh, the uh, 100 black men used to do the game against a yeah, fan you in too. Tennessee State. Yeah. Their numbers have kind of declined since then, both of them. And that's why they're looking at going into that. And so you take yourself out of these big markets where a large amount of your students have come from and go to these little country towns because you're playing these historically white colleges, what is that going to do for your recruiting base? So this is big. you got to understand that this is just not about a pure budget in one way. you got to look at the whole picture in terms of a consulting framework. What are your thoughts on that, Rob? Yeah. The mic is off. Hit that mic so we can hear you, man. I know you can give us some damage. Come on, Rob. Callaway. Come on. You're on mute. Yeah, he's looking at it. He's trying to hit it. You know, he got that fans' equipment over there. We got to get it right. <laughs> he he, he got to find the button. Yeah. <laughs> so while he's finding it, oh, there, there we go. There we go. I got it. 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 Come on, Rob. <laughs> I got it. There we go. You yeah. got to hear me now? Yeah. 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 A little technology, a little Teddy Riley thing going on over there. <laughs> uh, uh, but here's the thing, man. Tennessee State, yeah, Tennessee State finds themselves in a really odd situation. I mean, they are an HBCU through and through. Um, but I think that that it has lost a, a, a little bit of that luster 
because they don't come places like Atlanta anymore. That Atlanta football classic, that was a mainstay here uh, for the 100 black men. I hated the day that the 100 black men relinquished their game uh, for the Celebration Bowl to be born because that thing uh, was huge from uh, different standpoints. It was huge from uh, um, a standpoint that, you know, you don't get to go on a lot of HBCU campuses if you're a recruit. And so, you know, actually getting to see HB, an HBCU product, top-notch HBCU product up close and personal was really good. And then if you're in the band, you know, it's it's a built-in recruitment tool for, for bands as well. And we think about the band. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, I knew he was going to find a way to bring, bring, yeah, bring yeah, the yeah, energy yeah. and bring us a different perspective when we think about yeah. it. Well, As we do that, I know you're getting prepared for your show, and it's coming on 7.15 uh, uh, Central Time, 8.15 yeah. our time. So as you do that, tell us what you, what's coming on your show today. All right. Well, before I do that, let me just send big shouts out to Dr. Reginald McDonald, the band director of the Aristocratic Bands, Tennessee State University, Bama State nice. Horns. Yeah, yeah he, was horn. he used to be uh, the head band director at my high school, Southwest Cab. And so uh, this dude, he's just, you know, top notch. And so adding Tennessee State to the sweat, that would be phenomenal. I'll just say that. You know, let me just say that piece. Um, coming up on <laughs> I'm, I'm adding everybody to the sweat. You want to come to the sweat? Come to the sweat. <laughs> you know, Miles, I don't got to talk to Miles. <laughs> yeah, right. We're at our 20 Super Conference. Right. I love it. Come, come to Cal- come on. So we got the man. We got this saying at Bama State, it's always a great time to be a Hornet. Man, it's always a great time to be in the swag. Just come on, everybody. Just come on, <laughs> just come on man. It don't matter. We have plenty of good room. And, and what the church say, uh, this church, the door swing on welcome hinges. So y'all come on, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but coming up tonight, man, uh, Charles McClellan, the guy that, that y'all, I know I talked to last week, black commissioner. I'm um, going to check in with the show, of course. Got to talk to him. To get his perspective on this whole fam you thing and not only that uh but what's going to happen with the MEAC and swag these partner games because we got the MEAC swag challenge we got the celebration bowl finding your uh contract for the celebration bowl and so i'm uh, going to talk to him about that and then you know um for my people in alabama you know we got a new stadium being built in birmingham university of alabama birmingham and so the word is is that we're going to leave the, the confines of Legion Field, and we're going to take our talents in the Magic City Classic to the new stadium. And so I got to ask him about that because, that you know, that's that's one of Birmingham's biggest uh, revenue generators. So, you know, it's a lot going on on the HBC report. And we're celebrating the year 2000, you know, with the music and all that good stuff. So there it is. Oh, I love it. That's how we're going to yeah. We're going to end it right there. Give a shout-out. Uh, we had John Grant on talking about that, which is a point. Uh, that we also need to bring to the table and consider the enrollment has kicked in for North Carolina A&T and Alcorn uh, related to uh, when they played in the Celebration Bowl and what that television exposure so that's yeah. another thing that goes back to the point I was making with Tennessee State and the thing that North Carolina A&T and Hampton for that matter uh, loses without being able to participate <laughs> in the MEAC Swag Challenge so um, yeah. it's a lot of variables out there and it's we might as well study have- you know, as I do, my students will get a chance to do it. So, how about we'll let that? Them know. Go ahead, Rob. How about that we just do a swag swag challenge? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I yeah. know it. Then we're going to do it right. So, we're we going to shout it out. We're going to tune it out and get everybody going today. So, um, we'll get out of here so you can get started today in okay, terms of what's going on. And uh, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Give everybody, everybody a chance to join us with the big time music here. I'm Dr. Kenyatta Cavill inside the HBC Sports Lab. Uh, since we brought Rob on, I won't uh, insult y'all today to play the music a little bit. You know how, how we uh, doing all that. So Hey, Rob, where's our song? Where's the song with me and Charles? Still waiting? Hey, <laughs> I got y'all, man. I got y'all. I got y'all. For real. For real. Thank y'all for following me on social media. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I was like, oh, look, I got some big time followers now. Like, how <laughs> <laughs> is following me? Awesome. Yeah. You know, that's how we're going to do it when we do it like that, uh, going back and forth. This is Dr. Kavir with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab uh, with Mike Watson, and Charles Bishop. Rob Callery jumping in here as he gets ready to do his thing on the show. Switch over to Spreaker so you can listen to him. He's bringing it. He has the interview with Charles Cullen. So, 
and of the SWAC Commissioner, Dr. Charles McCullen. I have to always throw that in there as we classmates are free. Y'all, y'all be careful every once in a while I'm sneaking there and calling Chuck. <laughs> I get so used to it. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of the College of HBC Sports, uh, with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop as we come to a close. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our lecture today. With the executive director of the Celebration Boat, John Grant. Uh, with that, trying to sit up here and make sure I can get some of this music going. You know, I feel bad with that music playing. I just feel lost in some way. So I'm going to make sure I can give that to you. But with that, again, thank you for joining us and listening to Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with uh, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Every Tuesday right here from 6 to 7. We'll hang over a little bit as we'll bring in Rob Callaway as he does his show right here on KSOH 1230 AM, Houston, Texas. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Of course, of course, course let your let your business. Business. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. It was a, a monumental game for a and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God, it was them this time. We knew it was gonna be a battle. Look at Jake Avis' record. 202 and 36, I think, some some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East Stands. Whites were sitting in the West Stands. And the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we weren't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. <laughs>